distinguished guests. Well before the date of assumption of any new position, the candidate had better be clear about the job description. With that in mind, I first looked at the Constitution. And while it outlined certain duties and functions of president, the office holder's role was not defined. So I moved on. Aided by memory, anecdote, and available material, I analyzed the leadership and decision-making styles of my predecessors in office. This rather unscientific research led me to the conclusion that it falls to each president to define, within prescribed limits, his, or in this case, her own role. After much deliberation, I identified my role as humble first servant with a mandate to render service with enthusiasm. As I continued thinking about how I, as president, and we as a nation would navigate the course ahead, I remembered that years ago, after completing several marathons, I was looking through a Runner's World magazine and saw an article by one of the United States' foremost authorities on long distance running. He opined that the ideal weight for a female marathoner was 95 to 100 pounds. I haven't stopped laughing yet, since at my lightest, I was at least twice time that. Then I went on to more serious reflection on that state of affairs and thought, what if I had this information before I undertook the challenge? Would I have allowed it to stop me? Because if I had, I would not have stretched myself beyond my then known limits, nor made wonderful friends. I would have not undertaken wild adventures, such as trying to climb a mountain that begins with the name Kilaman. And most importantly, perhaps, I would not be able today to look back on that period, which was not without its hurdles, literal and figurative, with a sense of satisfaction, pride, and accomplishment. Could this apply to us today? I say us because I consider that for the period of my tenure, our destinies, that is, mine and that of our nation, are inextricably linked. Many experts reel an armchair in positions high and low beset us round with dismal stories. They tell us that Trinidad and Tobago is perilously close to the point of no return. Crime, corruption, racism, abysmal public services, and an ineffective judicial system, among other problems, are so thick on the ground that all hope is lost. That we will soon be, if we are not there already, a failed state, however defined. So how do we respond to these commentators and to our reality? What are we to do? As I see it, we have but two choices. Option one, we can lament, blame, criticize, and allow a miasma of despair to overwhelm us. Or option two, we can consciously and intentionally choose the alternative. Not wish for or dream about or only hope and pray for the alternative, but make up a hard mind to mobilize forces and resources to step out boldly and make Trinidad and Tobago a better place for us and our children. All the while understanding that though faith is a necessity, without action it is useless. Now let me confess up front to sharing certain characteristics with Pollyanna. That storybook character filled with irrepressible optimism and a tendency to find good in everything. But I do not know, nor have I ever lived in an ivory tower, nor worn blinkers. I well may have had some advantages that others have not. But having lived among you in Trinidad and Tobago all my life, I have endured the maddening inefficiencies of the public sector, 
I too drive with my windows up or doors locked even in broad daylight, or at least I used to. I have lost two cars to thieves and have waited hours for medical attention for a relative at our hospital. I am painfully aware of what the murder count is and how many victims have been women and children slaughtered in acts of domestic violence. I am cognizant of the volatile tensions in East Port of Spain and see persons affected by mental illness, addiction, and homelessness sleeping on the streets. And if I needed to get to Tobago in a hurry, I could not be certain if or when I would arrive. So I comprehend fully the state of the state and so understand why we might think we have every reason to despair. None of us is blind or foolish enough to deny that Trinidad and Tobago is going through dark times. But allow me to echo the words of C.S. Lewis when I say, this is a good world gone wrong, but it still retains the memory of what ought to have been. So here comes the Pollyanna in me. It is my mission, and I feel mission entirely possible, to infect each and every one of you with a bright and positive spirit as we strive to turn our beloved nation into what it ought to have been and still can be. So let us all today choose option two. Confront the darkness and declare that it will not take over. It is a tenet of most major religions that light triumphs over darkness. Our Hindu community expresses the most visible manifestation of this with rows of deers shining on the darkest night to symbolize the triumph of good over evil, of light over darkness. Even the humanists among us, who are of the school of philosophy that believes in human effort and ingenuity rather than religion, will agree that light is best seen in the dark, and it is always darkest just before the dawn. Light always serves a purpose. It directs ships to safe harbor. It illuminates our path. It can lead the way. It purifies and exposes hidden dangers and promotes clear vision. And if legend is to be believed, it even repels vampires, goblins, and foul fiends that try to daunt our spirit. What I am saying this morning is not novel, but as a wise man once said, people need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed. Our challenge then is to be light and see light. And I use the word challenge quite deliberately because this is not a mission for the faint-hearted. If I might loosely borrow some words from the Bard of Avon in Henry V, we will need to stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide, hold hard the breath, and bend up every spirit to his full height. This will not be accomplished easily or overnight. It's a marathon, folks. Whether we set off with a burst of speed or at a crawl, there will come periods in which we fade and need to employ the just to the next lamppost strategy as we soul there on. But there will also be unexpected surges of energy when we are able to propel ourselves forward with extraordinary vigor. We must not become wary. We must trust that in time, we will reap the benefits of our efforts. Being a light does not necessitate grand schemes or accomplishments. A flickering candle can be just as effective as a blazing bushfire in the right environment. So be a light at your home, instill discipline, model good behavior. You can be a light in your school, pay more attention to the lesson than your phone, protect the vulnerable, respect those in the authority. Light can be seen in a community where people care for their environment and are tolerant of the views, beliefs, and practices of others, all the while reimagining and re-engineering that village that it takes to raise today's child. 
and a, work in, a light in the workplace. Get to work on time. Actually do some work while you're there and go the extra mile if need be. On a larger scale, we can be a light in our nation. For that, we will have to put country first. Before self, family, party, or tribe. Let us not fool ourselves. At times, this will take serious sacrifice. It is the work of patriots. Love for our Twilai has to be planted, nurtured, and buttressed day after day after day, and the seed must be sown in childhood. I am always awake, amazed at the way some of us behave, as if the national anthem is for our entertainment rather than an opportunity to express afresh our national identity. We don't sing and then at the end we applaud. We also do not rehearse enough the nation building lyrics of God bless our nation and our nation's dawning. Don't underestimate the value of knowing and regularly repeating those inspirational and aspirational words. Let none of us miss the relevance and timeliness of one of our nationals, Len Peters, being awarded in February of this year the first Commonwealth Points of Light Award for exceptional voluntary service in protecting endangered turtle species. Recognize, too, Gabrielle Branch, who won an award from the United World Colleges for an innovative project targeting secondary schools in Trinidad and Tobago. Gabrielle is reported to have said that if she could do her part to change the mindset of everyone towards the environment and encourage others to continue in this vein, she would have made a difference. Be inspired by Len, Gabrielle, and others to be and look for points of light. Sometimes that light would be straight ahead, glaring and obvious. At other times, we may need to employ peripheral vision and a pair of binoculars. But fear not, it is always present. Even in the midst of the relentless assault on our sensibilities as individuals and as a nation, every day we can find shining examples of all that is good about us. Search them out, encourage and support them in order to spread the gloom. Friends, Trinbegonians, countrymen, I have listened carefully to all that you have said following my election. Your high expectations indicate to me that there must be a mustard seed of faith that things can get better in our twin island republic. And if I read that right, all things, good things, are indeed possible for Trinidad and Tobago. As your servant, I promise that I will work tirelessly. I labor night and day to do my best by word and deed to both be a light and to spread the light of others at every opportunity. But if you feel you're going to leave me alone to do all the heavy lifting, you're sadly mistaken. I have something to ask of you. No, I'm not asking for a honeymoon period. I well understand that your reservoir of patience with holders of high office has all but run dry. But I'm going to rub my imaginary lamp and appeal to the collective genie that you are. So here are my three wishes. First, I ask all of you to find ways to make a positive difference in whatever your sphere of influence. Not necessarily ambitious designs, but rather specific, practicable, doable projects, the results of which can be seen and measured in the short term. And then let us celebrate each success. Many individuals and organizations have been asking to meet with me. Let's not meet just for meeting's sake. We don't have that luxury. Come armed with your ideas, your feasible projects to improve the quality of life in our nation. Nothing will catch my attention faster than a man or woman with a plan. Secondly, 
I ask those of you with a platform from which to disseminate your views to find new and creative ways to inspire your audience while reporting responsibly and commenting civilly on the facts and in particular on social media which is here to stay and has great value by giving a voice to those who might otherwise remain voiceless. But reckless use of this or any communication channel will defeat its very purpose. Is it at all possible to dial down the rhetoric while adding your two cents worth to the discussion on any issue? And last, and before I run out of goodwill, we speak all the time about how violent a society we have become. True. But the climate of violence is not created or even birthed in overt acts. It's embedded in everyday talk, in commonplace interaction, in schools, in marketplaces, in business places, in rum shops, and worst of all, in homes. I ask you to be mindful in your use of language, remembering that a soft answer often turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger, and that pleasant speech increases one's persuasiveness. When we have the inevitable differences of opinion, we can do so without the savagery, the ad hominem attacks, and gratuitous insults. In closing, I thank God for his mercies. For me, the boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I thank the Electoral College for its vote of confidence in me and hope that the unanimity achieved on that occasion will be experienced again and again for the good of our country. I thank former President Carmona for his service to the nation and for his consideration and kindness to me in the lead up to his hosting of today's inauguration. I have known him since the late 70s when as fellow campus Calypsonians, he was the prophet of Sisyphus and I brick house, so I expected no less. I thank my mother, family, and friends for their unstinting support and regular reality checks. And if I ever am getting too big for my britches, I'm sure they'll cut me down to size, keeping me humble and grounded. And most of all, I thank you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, for your good wishes and your prayers as I undertake this awesome responsibility. Please, do not let me walk alone. By faith, let us stand together and then go forward side by side as we carry our nation to greatness. I thank you. A standing ovation for her Excellency, Paula May Weeks, President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and with an inaugural address that has indeed set the tone.